uttered out of your mouth is precious and important and needed. Love the line in that song, Lord, where it says, everything else can wait. That's a word for the church. So, Lord, I would ask that you would help us to put aside any distraction now that would keep us from hearing your voice. says lies. Maybe it's an old identity that says I'm not worthy of hearing from God. I'm not worthy of being used by God. All of your word is God breathed. to grow, to be more like you, and to be used by you. It's our desire that our worship would be in spirit and in truth. So speak truth to us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. First of all, I want to welcome those that are watching us on Facebook and uh, from all over the country. I got to kind of text with Kay Cates today, so and I know, Kay, you're watching, and so hi. It's good to, to see you. Well, you actually see me. I don't see you. That's kind of unfair, but I'm glad that you're here with us, and uh, just off the top of my head, I know that Tori and Ryan are out of state, and... Um, so they're watching on, instead of Ryan sending the broadcast out, he's sitting in front of a computer watching it. So that's kind of cool. And uh, so glad that they're joining us as well. And whoever else would, would uh, be joining us. So hey, let me, let me start out with a, with a, a, a kind of a, a neat story. So, so uh, last week, you know, I mentioned that, that, that Foy was here and he preached this message. And, and uh, you know, he start, started talking about spiritual warfare a little bit and you know, and when we engage the enemy, he's happy to just say, oh, yeah, you want some of this? Come on, come get it, right? So, so he comes, and, and it was funny because, you know, evil just, like, visited the front door of the church this week. Like, it was just, you know, it's just all kinds of stuff. But anyways, this is the thing that, that happened. It was kind of, kind of a neat story. So, so Monday night, you guys, you know when each and every one of you come here to pray on Monday nights? That was a dig. Okay. But when you guys come here on Monday nights from 7 to 8 to pray this week, say, I will. <clears throat> don't, don't forget what the Lord says about a vow. Okay, so I'm just saying that's why I got quiet in here. And uh, Monday night football is starting. Hey, and anyway, um, so, so we come in here at, 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 well, at 7 o'clock, people came in here to pray. And I was in my office doing a little studying preparation for this. And. I didn't get out of the office till about 10 past 7, and when I got up out of, bless you, when I got up out of the office to come in here, I could hear the music that we play up in the coffee bar. The way we do that is we use an iPad. It's actually this one right here. Hi. And, and, and so we use that one to Bluetooth to that speaker out there. We have worship music playing all the time. You know, I try to leave it on even at night. It keeps the demons away. I'm just saying. And um, <coughs> so, so at, at 7.09... I heard the music playing, and then I came in here and, and prayed with you guys. And when I got done, I walked out there, and what's up, Padawan? And uh, so we walk out there, 
and there's no music. So you see, what happens when you listen to Pandora is that it times out after like two and a half hours, you know? So the little thing comes on and says, still listening? You just press it and it comes on. So I, it went off and I said, okay, it must just have timed out. So I went out to the lobby and I opened up the drawer where the iPad is and the stinking thing is gone. I'm like, really? Really? So someone stole the iPad. It's like lame, right? So <coughs> I guess it was Nick, wasn't it you who talked about find a phone? He said, what about find a phone, you know? And I'm like, I'm old now, so I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. And so he helped me with that, and, we, and, and, I, and I put a tracker on the iPad, because it's all hooked into the same account, you know, all of our stuff here that's Apple's all in one account. <coughs> and that was it. And, and, and so the next day, we were having our small group on, we have a rev group at our house on Tuesday nights, and so we were sitting there, we are just getting ready. My wife had cooked all this stuff for tacos, which is always a good time, right? That's the reason to start a rev group right there. Like you don't nothing spiritual, just eat tacos. So, um, so we're just getting ready. She had she had slaved in the kitchen and is getting ready to serve. And all of a sudden, I get I don't know if it was you or someone asked, "Hey, did you did, have you have you heard anything about the iPad? Have you looked and seen?" So I said, "Well, let me check." I grabbed my phone and I looked, and it said that an hour before, it had picked up where it was. Someone had tried to get online. So it pinged it, right, right there. So like, I think it was Ramon said, well, why don't we, you know, after dinner, let's, let's go, man. Let's just go. Let's go get that thing. I'm like, no, let's go get it right now, right? So we jumped, tough guys that we are, right? Tori's like, let me go, let me go. I'll get that iPad back, you know? <laughs> and so, so, we're, so me and, and, and Pastor Ramon and, and Ryan, we got into, into my uh, 92 Cadillac Fleetwood Brome. <laughs> which made it even better. That's the only car you could use for this. And we get in the car, and you, it's cool because you can like press right on it, and it'll give you GPS right to the address, like right to the front door. So we're, I was gonna like just knock up, go up to the front door because I'm super tough, right? You know, give me my iPad, or I won't, and I won't press charges. You know what I mean? I was gonna be tough guy, like because we all want to do that in a movie. Except when we got to the address and the road ended and it turned into a dirt road that went to the side so you couldn't see from the road what's going on in there. So when they sh start shooting us, no one will know. And I walk back there and there's this just dump of, a, I mean, it is bad, right? It is rough. And right in front of us is a brand new Camry and a convertible BMW. And I'm like, yeah, let's, let's figure out what's going on up in here, right? So we didn't go in, so we backed out of that one, and, and we called the police, and they came, and they actually went up to the door and went in and got our iPad back. It's kind of cool, right? It actually worked, man. It worked. It was cool, man. It was cool. So anyway, I want to share that story with you. All right, well... <laughs> Well, I was, uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I'd like to think so. I was having fun, let's just say that, you know. You know, everyone assumes that, you know, oh, you're the pastor, so you're like always in prayer, you know. Like, no, I was having a good time. Like, I thought I was going to be a tough guy and go to the door, and, you know, I'm just being honest with you, you know. So, anyway, yeah. So. <laughs> a big iPhone, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we're uh, let's jump back into our series. We're, we're going through a series called Red Wall, Red Letter. Red Wall being the one out there that says together, let's ascend the mountain of the Lord. And that's what we want to do. And Jesus was so kind. And in the Sermon on the Mount, that's what he does. He goes up onto a hill, a mountain, whatever. And he goes and he actually, there's some red words right there. He actually goes up onto a mountain and teaches his people how to live, you know what I mean? So what greater thing to do than to sit at the foot of Jesus Christ? He's preaching a sermon. Like, that would be amazing if he was here at this church preaching behind this pulpit. And uh, that's what we see in the Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew chapter 5, and uh, so we're going to continue there today. Happy People Part 3. We're going through the Beatitudes, and uh, the Beatitudes are just 
Happy are those. Uh, supremely blessed are those who. Well off are those who. Fortunate are those who. And so we want to be happy and we want to know how Jesus says we could get there. So um, if you would, just turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be there in a little bit. Uh, as you're turning there, I just want to say um, I am a mutt. You know what I mean by a mutt? Uh, we're in America. There's a lot of us mutts in there. Kind of a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I'm, I'm Jewish, and I grew up in Massachusetts. I'm a Jewish guy. I went to temple, bar mitzvah, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I got saved in a little Southern Baptist church in Tavares, uh, far cry from the Jewish temple. And uh, parents aren't real happy about that, but they'll have to live with that. Uh, after I got saved there, I attended a straight-up independent Baptist seminary. Um, and then after that, uh, I worked as an associate pastor at a church of God. There's two churches of God, because that's just denominations and in, in whatever. But this one's Church of God, Anderson, Indiana. So, this, you know, it's non-charismatic. It's a little bit more legalistic. Uh, I'm not any of those things, you know. And, and I can tell you, and, and maybe many of you can, also, that with each denomination, each group, they all have a, this construct, this doctrine that they believe, and they just teach it, and they want to spread it as the truth. And so, it's not so much like the it's not so much here's what we believe. It's 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 an additional book sometimes that says here this is what we believe about that, right? And so they want to teach you the things that they believe as. The truth, and and I, I am uh, uh, very much aware of the fact that denominational, you know, John Calvin. Test. Anyone? All right. You guys going to figure it out? Cutting in and out. Hey guys. So, guess, guess the guy this week. One of these. All right. Let's see if we can get this thing to stay on. I'm a little loud. You can turn me down a little bit, please. Thank you. Even more, even more, even more, even more, even more. Okay, right there. That sounds about right. So, um, so as I was saying, each one of these groups has this doctrine or this construct that they have that they believe of the Bible, and they try to promote this thing as the totality of truth. But here's the thing. How many people in this room have one of these? Hold up your Bible if you have one. You have one, right? Okay, awesome. You have one? And sometimes you have it on a phone. She's got it on a phone, right? That's cool. Um, you, have, you have the Bible, and inside the Bible, it would teach you that when you accept Christ, that you get the mind of Christ and that you get the spirit of Christ. And so if you have the spirit, which gives you the ability to understand and discern spiritual things, i.e. the word of God, and he's given you the mind that you can think and you have the totality of the Bible, I would just ask you to do this. Don't let John Wesley, John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, Billy Graham, or me, or anyone else decide for you what the truth is, okay? That's what you, you, you have, you've been, like, we live in a really awesome country. We have our digs about our country and our leaders and all that stuff. But here in our country, we have the access to one of these, and you don't get arrested or put in jail for it. Like, it's kind of cool, at least right now. So you have this, you have the mind of Christ, you have the spirit of Christ to discern and think and make some choices that will affect your forever. 
And so I want you to be able to do that because none of those people that I mentioned to you, great guys, John Calvin, Martin Luther, I mean, all, Billy Gray, all these great, they, no, none of them can save you. None of them can change you. They're great men who did great things and preached strong words, but none of them can and none of them will be there. <laughs> you know, the, the jokes about Peter at the gate and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know what's going to be. I have never been. The Bible says you, nobody's been to heaven and come back. Like, so nobody's been there. I don't know what the gates are like. I don't know if Peter's sitting right there or not. But I can tell you one thing. John Calvin isn't sitting there with a little, oh, you can get in and you can't. And there's no committee of Arminians saying, oh, you were Calvin's, Calvinist? No, you can't come in. Oh, you're, this Calvinist over here. Oh, you're Arminian. You can't get in. Like, there's none of that. There's one, Jesus. He decides if you get in or not. And he wrote a book, and he gave it to you, and you have access to it, and the ability to discern what it says, make some choices on your own. Because only you get to decide where you're going to be forever. That's it. So today I want to talk to you about like a major important thing. It's, and it's going to be derived out of Matthew chapter 5. We're just trying to figure out how to be happy. But in order to be happy, we have to understand who God really is. And I want to talk with you today about the sovereignty of God. I want to talk to you about the sovereignty of God in the three following verses that we, uh, we left off on. So in Matthew chapter 5, we will actually be reading three verses that's going to be the main text of our message, 7, 8, and 9. Those are what we're going to dive into today. I want to talk to you about the sovereignty of God in these things. Uh, greater knowledge leads to greater worship, and so we need to understand the sovereignty of God, and you'll know why I'm talking about this as we go on. But <clears throat> the definition of sovereignty is the supreme power or authority and with that supreme power and authority, it gives you the right to self-govern. Like, no one can tell you what to do, right? You're it. The buck stops here, right? The authority of anyone or anything to self-govern. So just because we're here in this country and we're finite people here on earth... I want to illustrate it this way. Like, the United States is a, has you ever heard anyone say it's a sovereign nation? You've heard this, right? What, well, it, no, that means no other nation can tell it what to do and how to run things. Like, I get all that, right? But is it because we're awesome and better than all the other people on earth that makes us sovereign so nobody can tell us what to do? It's not that at all. It's not that at all. Here's why we're sovereign. The Declaration of Independence, the first two sentences, two times it says that our rights and our freedom are God-given. That's why. See? So, are we a sovereign nation? Well, yes, but only, yeah, but only I'm just trying to blow your mind on what sovereign means tonight. I want to, re, I want to, I want to help you rediscover on your own what the sovereignty of God is. So is, is our nation a sovereign nation? Well, kind of, but it's only because God says so. So sovereignty is kind of a slippery kind of a thing. You can't really grab a hold of it. See, we're a sovereign nation, but God keeps his hand on everything in this way. He reserves the right to mess with your circumstances and your situation and your results Anytime he wants for his namesake. And if you don't believe that, ask Mother Mary. Right? Just hanging out, young lady, doing her thing back there in this little podunk town. She's got a little boyfriend. He's a nice guy. They're going to open up a little carpentry business. Oh, you're going to have the savior of the world. Boom! Right? Were you planning that one, Mary? Yeah, no, not at all. Where does that baby come from? Haven't had any time with my husband yet. What's going on? I jacked with you. That's what I did. How about uh, Jonah? Jonah's just doing his thing, this prophet thing, right? Going along, speaking for God here and there. And God says, go do this. And he's like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Oh, yeah? Really? You're not going to do that, huh? How about, how about you jump in this boat, right? How about I cause a massive storm to come over that boat? 
And then when they throw you overboard, how about if I cause this big fish, whale, whatever it was, Christians fight, this big fish to come and swallow you and hold you in its stomach, say gross, and then puke you out three days later. You think he planned all that one? No, God messed with him. How about the Apostle Paul? He's just, he's just doing his God thing, man. He's, he's persecuting the church because they're not doing things the way the old rabbi said that it should happen. So he's going along down the road one day with the authority of the spiritual leaders and stuff to go mess with the church, with the followers of the way. And what happens? Wham! Knocks him on his fanny. Why are you persecuting me, boy? I want you to go to the known world and tell people about me. Did he have a choice? I messed with him big time. So, this whole idea of sovereignty, I don't know, man, it's kind of slippery. Are we sovereign as a nation? Are we sovereign? I don't know. I mean, can we, can we declare war? We can declare war. Can we declare peace? Yes. Can we choose well and therefore grow and endure? Can we choose poorly and cause a fall? Really? I beg to differ. And the word of God would absolutely stand against every single one of those yes just now. Do yourself a favor and look at Acts 17, 26. This is the word of God, not my opinion, not yours. Acts 17, 26. Are we a sovereign nation? Do we make choices? Or maybe not. Let me just read in verse 24 down just to give you context. That's super important when you read the Bible, right? He is the God who made the world and everything in it. What does that mean? I'll give you what that means. Ownership, right? It's his. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He, he himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. Here we go. You ready? From one man. Who was that? Got him. He created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. Are we sovereign? Nope. No, we're not. And so maybe just a little, and I needed to hear this, and I was reminded today when I read this again, a little less political rhetoric coming off the pulpit on Facebook from your pastor. Because it doesn't make any difference who our president is. God's the president. He decided when America would form, when it will fall, and how big it will be. It's his decision, not ours. So why don't we just all jump on board the God train and do what he says, no matter who gets in office from now on, whether you like him or her or what party they're from, why don't you just do what God says and pray for him? That's it. So, sovereign, again, sovereignty is slippery for sure. Is God really sovereign as, well, like, in the way that some might assume? See, we all have this construct of what we think the sovereignty of God is. Like, how, how he's in charge, right? We all have it. Yours is different than mine. We all have a different perspective. I'm just challenging your thinking tonight. I want you to just start thinking about this stuff. Don't just sweep it under the rug of denominational tradition. Make a choice, right? So is, so, is God really sovereign, sovereign in the way that some might assume when he says things like, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person? By changing the way you think? And you see, see, when I read that, I think the word of God is clear that there's some personal responsibility in that. What is he saying? Susan, will you let me change you? See, some people have this assumption that God's in charge in this way. He does what he wants. He doesn't care what you think. I'm doing this! But that's not what the word of God says. The word of God says, let God transform you into a new person. So you're invited into the dance of sovereignty with him. Personal responsibility. 2 Corinthians 5.17, you guys might know this verse. I say it a lot. If anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ tonight? 
I'm in Christ. Are you in Christ? Rejoice about that, right? If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died. Behold, the new man. Right? You're not living in the flesh anymore as a flesh being. You're a flesh being, but you're living by the Spirit of God. He's leading you. He's guiding you, hopefully, more and more every day. Increasing less of me, more of him. Like, we're living by the Spirit's leading, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. We've been, re- we've been reborn of the Spirit, not just flesh, but of the Spirit. However, Galatians, this is, the more you know, the less you know. <laughs> Galatians 5.25 says, Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in everything. Is that God saying, Marie, you're in the Spirit now, and I'm going to move you, no matter what you say or do, I'm doing it. When you read the Word of God, it says, so since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading. There's some more personal responsibility there. It's a word I love to use and no one likes to hear. It's choice. It's a choice. Why am I talking about all this? We're just talking about the Beatitudes, right? We're just talking about being happy. I just want to be happy, man. I came to church. I felt like crap. I need a little Joel Osteen. Could you help me out, please? Make me happy. I'm not ripping on him. He's got a great smile. And he's got, he's, he's, he does his thing. It's not my thing. It's his thing. It's what God's asked him to do. God bless his heart. That's totally cool. But I just came here tonight because I just want to be happy and blessed. Right? Well, I would just say that you can't be happy and blessed of God if you don't follow what his word says. And so that's what this church is all about. I'm trying to share the word of God with you. And I believe that if we do that faithfully, he'll change your life and you'll be blessed. People are taught and they believe that sovereignty means God's got this. God's got this, right? Pretty. I heard somebody say it today. I would say that maybe... All of us at some point in our life has said that. If you're a Christian, hey, God's got this. And that is very true. But we're taught in a way that the word of God would stand firmly against. And I'll explain what I mean. God's got this doesn't mean you go to church one day, you feel convicted, you come to the altar, you repent of your sin, and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, and everything you need is provided for, and heaven is assured, and health and wealth, and listen, that false construct is going to fall. It's going to fall. He is sovereign in that he does set the rules, and he sets parameters, but he also sets the expectations of us, or the requirements that we must fulfill in order to receive from him the results he said he would give. Does that make sense? Okay. So how does your perception of God's got this, his sovereignty, how does it jive with, if you seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me? How does this sovereignty jive with if? You seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me. That's Jeremiah 29, 13. How does God's gut this in the context of your provision jive with Matthew 6, which we'll get to in the next couple weeks, where it says that the Father knows all that you need. Doesn't that feel good? Just Hey, why don't you just do this? Let's just do this. Let's just say this. God already knows what I need. Just Let's hear it. God already knows what I need. Doesn't that, doesn't that feel good? He knows, right? The one who spoke the planets into existence, he already knows what you need, so we don't have to worry, right? But here's the thing. Here's where sovereignty gets a little bit slippery, and you need to determine what this really means. Because he says, I know all that you need, but first, right? Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all those things that you know that I know that you need, then I'll give them to you. How does his sovereignty that you've been taught jive with that biblical truth? That there's something you need to do to get the God's got this. It's not just 
Here you go. Do whatever you want. Boom. Like that doesn't work that way. So yes, God's got this. If. 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 Okay. And if every word of God is God breathed. If it is, then every single word of it, including the ifs, are important and worthy of your consideration. It would behoove you if you seek happiness, which is the Beatitudes, being ha- I want to be happy, Lord, I want to be happy. If you want to be happy, then you need to consider every word that is emanated from the Father's mouth. And so, I just want to just kind of stop there for a second and just say, over the years of my development and ministry and getting this thing established and what I'm doing and all that, I was, like I said, Jewish and then Southern Baptist and then Baptist and Church of God and all these different things. And every single time, I, like I remember when we were borrowing the Methodist church's building, and in jest, probably not, but in jest, the pastor whom I love, he, he'd come up, he'd listen to my messages sometime, he'd come up to me like, man, you're a, you're a Methodist and you don't even know it. And, and then, I, then I was in the Church of God and they tried to push me to be ordained, you know, because they wanted to own you and, de- and determine how God would use you. Like, that's their job. And, and so every single one of these groups, in every one of them, I've been pushed and pushed and pushed in these circles of denomination to massage the scriptures. Just massage them to fit their particular doctrine and construct, if you will. You know? It's, it's, a, it's one of those things like, we've been doing it a long time. I'm not ripping anybody, but we've been doing it a long time. This is our doctrine. This is what we believe of this. And so rather study this, let's study what we believe of this. And that's what we want to push out there And so we would massage scripture to to fit that particular (laughs) systematic theology. Right? This is what we're to do. We're to, to massage the scriptures to fit our systematic theology. This book here. And the, and the, Lord, the wor- Lord's word says not to judge another master's servant. So I'm not ripping the person here because they might believe wholeheartedly what they wrote. I think this is the greatest book of heresy. If I didn't use it as a reference to fight it, I'd burn it. And this is the absolute, I don't want to call it the Bible because it's not, but to, to, to some of the reformed I'm not a Protestant, y'all. I'm not Catholic. I'm not Protestant. I'm not Baptist. I am a Jesus Christ follower. And that's it, right? And I, listen, I am not, I am not here. To, listen, to even call it, system, do you know what theology is? It's a study of God. Simple, right? Biology, astrology, theology, study of God. To even call this Systematic theology is foolishness. How do you put the God of the universe who says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways, and Paul the Apostle, like I said, who got sucked up to the third heaven, he throws his hands up and says, who can understand the thoughts of God? How can you put him in a system? How does that even work? This is stupid, right? So, so I'm not going to, I don't, listen, in this book, This teaches, this is what you hear all the time in, 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 in some denominations is, well, what it's trying to say is, you hear that a lot, right? What Jesus was saying in effect was, how about what's written? How about that? Do you, I'm, I don't know, listen, I don't know Jesus maybe as much as you do. I don't even know, right? You might know him better than me. But I know one thing about Jesus. He's not unclear with his words, ever. He's never left anything going, 
When he said you're a, you're a son of the devil, you viper, right? There was no one going, hey, what is does he really mean that? Or was he just kind of being, no, 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 you are, right? You're a whitewashed tomb, pretty on the outside and filled with dead man's bones. Like he's not really like at a loss for words and he doesn't need somebody to explain well, what he was saying in effect is dumb, right? Dumb. So this book will teach us, and this is the main doctrinal source of most modern day reformed denominations, Protestant, and it says that Matthew 24, 13 would teach us that those who endure to the end we're the saved ones. That if you endure to the end, then that means you were saved. That the saved ones will endure to the end. Well, that's weird. Why don't you guys do me a favor and turn to Matthew chapter 24, 13. Because I just want you guys to see it. I'm not the only, like, I'm reading the NLT. We'll have some, I know we got a couple King James guys in here. So, Jonathan, I need you to read that for me in just a second. Matthew 24, 13. Does it say that all people that are saved will endure to the end? Well, let's just see. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Seems to be... Well, let me check your version. What's your version say? Maybe my version's wrong. What's yours say? 13. Hmm. So it seems like there's a kind of an if there, isn't there? So is he saying in effect, like, let's, can we just get past what I'm saying now? You know what I'm saying, right? We need to just stop with the denominational tradition that says, it just means this, just don't worry about it, it's okay, just disregard that one thing, because all these other ones, 1 Corinthians 4, 6 says, do not go beyond what is written, right? And that's what we endeavor to do here, is to just go with what's Written. So with that in mind, let's look here at the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 7, what does it say? God blesses. I don't like that version. I think it's better and more accurate in some of the other translations which say, blessed are those. Happy are those. Well off are those. Fortunate are those. If you want to say God blesses, okay, I get that. What he's, the, the translators here are saying that you can't really be happy unless it's God making you happy. So I get that. But blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Okay? So, so we're, we, we want to not go beyond what is written. We want to see what it says. Okay? The results are God's, but the person, the results, what's the result here? You'll be shown mercy, right? Isn't that what it says? Okay. So the results are God's. He determined that. He said it, red letters, right out of the mouth of Jesus. But the person, you and I, must choose to get that blessing. It it's, it's just says it right there, right? If you want mercy, you got to give mercy, right? And listen, these things in the Beatitude, just a side note, they're not gifts. Okay? Gifts are, are, are freebies that you didn't earn, you didn't ask, you didn't, you didn't warrant them in any way. You get it, like, to, like that air that you're breathing right now? Yeah, did you get? Did you somehow make that? No. How about today? Did you get? Did you did you invent the sun this morning coming up? Was that your doing? Nothing, right? How about the fact that God loves you? Bask, right? Right? Did you deserve it? Everyone should say no. I know you guys. Right? These are gifts. Right? But the Beatitudes, not gifts. They're not gifts. They're offers. They're offers. They're, they're offers based on your choice to either act or not to act. Okay? Now, I'm not, I, I, got, I got to say this, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably got some Southern Baptist folks in the room that are just like frothing at the mouth right now. I am not by any means teaching works salvation like that you can somehow earn the favor of God 
the, 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 the position in heaven, you can't earn anything because even if you, even if you wanted to, you don't own heaven, you didn't create heaven, so you don't get to decide what, what happens there, right? So we can't do that. So it's not works salvation by any means. However, just really, the, my prayer this whole week has been, God, give me the right words to say here, because this is not easy, okay? The fullness of your salvific relationship, okay? The fullness of this relationship, if it was secured, the fullness of this relationship, if it was secured solely by believing Jesus died for you, if it was that simple and that easy, why would Jesus ever say that very few find it? And on the day that many will come to him, having said, Lord, Lord, right? So they had this appearance of, they may have even been doing it like full throttle, you know? Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, who are you? Like he knows you. You understand that, right? He knows that you didn't mean what you said. <laughs> That's what he's saying, right? He knows because he's God. He knows everyone. So he's like, yeah, I never, you weren't on my team. See, we carry this assumption. When we read the word Lord, Lord, there's this assumption that when we call him Lord and we came to the altar and we said yes to him and I'm on the cross and you're on my cross for me, Jesus, and you paid the price for me, and so there's this assumption that comes that just believing in him for yourself, like that's, I get everything right there. But listen, this is the challenge for the, this weekend. You have to decide what's true. What you think and what you feel and what others have taught or what it says. And you're all reading this stuff. That's why we do this in this church. I don't put it up on the screen. You read it. I want you to read God's word. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So mercy is what? Not receiving the fair and just punishment for your crime. Would you guys all agree with that? Is that a good definition of that? Not receiving the fair and just punishment for your crime. Whatever you did, whatever you deserve, mercy says you don't get that. You rob a bank, you should get five to ten, but I'm going to withhold the punishment, and you get to walk free. That's mercy, right? Do you all agree? So we got to know what mercy is, and we also got to know this. Don't let somebody teach you reductionism here that deconstructs what Jesus says to think that it's if you show mercy to people then they'll show mercy to you no that's not what it says right and the reason why it doesn't say that <coughs> two reasons one if not every most if not every person in this room have treated people kindly that didn't deserve it and got crapped on for it, right? Right? So, so is God a liar? No. So it can't mean people for people, right? And the other thing we know is that all these Beatitudes, all nine of them, are all structured in a way that says, if you do this, God will do that. If you do this, kingdom of God. If you do this, the comfort of God. If you do this, the child of God. It's you do something, God does something. You do something, God does something. And Jesus is not mincing his words. He's not confusing by saying, okay, there's eight of them that are that, but right smack dab in the middle, I'm going to throw you a curveball that you don't understand. I'm going to throw you up, mess you up, jack you up, so you trip up and fail in this one. Jesus isn't like that, right? Not at all. So it's not reduced down to if you give mercy to people, they'll give mercy to you. We're not at liberty to change the word of God, are we? And so if our happiness hinges solely upon God showing us mercy, because that's what this is. Happy are those, well offer those, blessed are those who receive the mercy. 
So if our happiness is hinging upon him showing us mercy, then there's some things that we need to do. We need to show mercy first. I don't think that's taught. See, if you want, if you want God to cut revolution people some slack, that's what mercy is, right? In today's vernacular, cut me some slack, God. I jacked this whole thing up. I messed it up, God. Cut me some slack, right? That's what mercy is, right? If you want God to cut you some slack, then Revolution Church people better be the most allowance for false people in the whole world. We can't turn the cheek, take one for the team, forgive them when they don't deserve it. Then don't expect God to give you any mercy. I mean, that's just kind of what it says, right? Do you know that um, oftentimes forgiveness and mercy are interchangeable in the Word of God? Did you know that? And I understand that when I read, please know that when I read this, all of a sudden now this next thing jumps into my brain, and I'm like, I can't avoid, I don't want to talk about that, God. I don't want to talk about that. I know most people in this church, and they don't want to hear what this has to say, but I don't care. Because it's coming a day, and, and I need to make sure that's going to be a good day for me. So, I, listen, I understand that mercy and forgiveness were offered on the cross by Jesus, but not to the neglect of Jesus' words. Do you see? Okay. And I, listen, of all the holidays, some people love Christmas, some people love Easter, I love Good Friday. That's my favorite holiday. The cross, the cross, the cross, the cross has been everything to me since I became a Christian. I love the cross, the cross, the cross. You can have your Christmas, y'all. You can have your Easter right there. That means everything to me. But look at Matthew 6, 14. We get forgiveness at the cross, right? Don't we get forgiveness at the cross? But Matthew 6, 14, from the mouth of Jesus Christ, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. I don't know what you want to do with that. But I know, for me, I, I'm not just going to let it sit there and go, well, you know what, I, the cross, and I'm covered, and all my sins are forgiven, and I'm good. And Listen, Jesus Christ, the one who went to the cross to pay for your sin, just said something to you. And he said, if you don't forgive other people, my Father is not going to forgive you. And the only thing I would plead with you is to not sweep that verse underneath the rug of some denominational tradition, you have to do something with it. You have to do something with that. I'm not trying to take anything away from the cross at all. But don't just, don't go to the cross and then walk away thinking that it's done. When Jesus said it is finished, that doesn't mean that you are. That doesn't mean it's the last thing that you do. Maybe instead of everyone saying that's all that needed to be done, that's what I hear all the time, it's all that needed to be done, the, the blood covers you, all that. How about just maybe he was saying, my task here on earth was done. And now you need to do something in response to that and stop being so lazy. Don't stop at the cross. Here's more. And th like that, that, that got my attention, but here's way more. Okay, Matthew 18. Go, please go there. This is massive stuff, right? You've got to see this with your own eyes. Don't, don't just listen to me. Matthew 18. So as you're turning there, let me tell you what this is all about. 18, like 21 through 35, I think it is. So, is this, so, so Jesus is talking, right? And, and, he's, and he's telling people, what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. Like this, because, you know, the kingdom of heaven, like, you understand the kingdom of heaven is here right now. Like, if he, wherever the Lord reigns, there his kingdom is, 
right? So his kingdom is right there, is right there, is right there. I'm making a lot of assumptions. I'm hoping these amens mean that you believe. So, right? I'm hoping. So the kingdom is here, but not in its fullness. I get that. Not, so people are still asking, like, what, what's the kingdom of God? Like, it's a little confusing. It's not like this kingdom's here, because in our kingdoms, we've got castles and kings with, 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 with crowns and flowing robes, and that's not like that, right? And, and armies, and, well, it's not like that. Kingdom of heaven is different. So the kingdom of heaven is to be described by Jesus Christ, who is the king of the kingdom of heaven. And he's telling people what this kingdom is like. So he says the kingdom of heaven is like this. There's this dude who owes a bunch of money to, the, to, this, to this king. He's got this massive debt. Raise your hand when you start seeing yourself in the story. You have this, seriously, you have this, this, this guy has this massive debt that he can't pay, right? And the king calls him in and says, listen, you, like, you don't deserve this, right? You just, I'm just going to waive your debt. You're, you're, I'll, I got this. I write it off. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. You're good, right? Awesome news. Anyone a Christian in here? That's your story. Incredible, right? So he lets the guy go. And the guy goes and he finds some dude that owes him like 20 bucks. And he shakes him down. Like, for real? Love bug. Really? It's our mascot. It's the love church. So, so, he, so he forgives this guy this massive debt. That's us. And the guy goes, and he finds this other dude that owes him, like, he owed this king like a million dollars, and this guy owed him like a grand. And he goes and he shakes the guy down. And some other people hear this, because people are watching you, Christians. And, <laughs> and the king's like, really? You did that? And it says that he calls the guy back in, okay? He says, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing, right? Right? So it's like the exact same situation. The guy owes a million. The king says, I release you of the debt. You're forgiven. Same thing happens to the guy who was forgiven. So now, is he a Christian? If God has forgiven you of your sin, only Christians are forgiven of their sin, correct? Would you all agree on that? That's the only way to be forgiven is if you're a Christian, right? You can't be a good Buddha and get in. Like, that's just, okay, online. I'm going on record. Right? I'm bold in that. Like, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Okay? That's, that's it. So, so he's forgiven of the debt, and then he goes to this other guy, the guy who's, who's now saved and forgiven, and he doesn't forgive this guy. So now what happens? The king calls him back in and says, whoa, this is what you've done? It says that the king is angry, Puts the guy in prison, and listen, people aren't going to like this, and he gives him his debt back. You can read it. How many denomination systematic theologies just got blown apart? I can tell you my seminary professors would not be happy with me right now. The problem is, is that it is written. It is written. Right? And, and I don't like that. <laughs> but it is written. And then he follows it up by saying, and that is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is not some little nice story because I owed Jeff some money and he said it's okay and then he shook down Tom Lane. No, it's not some little people story. He said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. I take away the debt, and if, if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive you. What happened? He gave him his debt back. Right? This might clear the church even more, but I can't get around what it's... I'm just saying... Do something with that. <laughs> Don't just blow it off like it's no big, I'm covered by the blood. I'm covered by, listen, I get it. But, 
the blood of Jesus, right? The blood came from Jesus. And Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, you're not going to be forgiven either. I mean, it just says that. So, couldn't this be why? We're ta- let's go back to why we're studying the Beatitudes. I want to be happy. So couldn't this be why true happiness is neglected and often not found and found by a very few, Jesus says, right? Only a very few find it. Maybe this is why. Because the pursuit of mercy and forgiveness stopped at the cross. Jesus is talking kingdom of heaven stuff here, right? He's talking to forgiven. He's talking about forgiven people, not ones who will someday be for. If you forgive some people, then I'll save you. No, he's saying something totally different here. He's saying to the saved person, if you're saved, then I expect you to be the same way to other people, and if you're not, I won't forgive you. I mean, it's just, it's just written there. And see, I was, say, I was taught, as I'm sure all of you were taught, that forgiven people are saved people, and saved people are forgiven people. You can't be one without the other. They're the same. And yes, that's very, very true. But it would seem that t- Jesus is clearly teaching that after the cross, there is something you must do if the relationship is to be full and lasting. Just read what it says. Don't take my word on it. Look, I'm going I'm I'm to my, clump myself in that pile of Billy Graham, John Calvin, John Wesley, and every other preacher on the face of the earth because I can't save you. Only Jesus can, and he's teaching you how that gets done right here. Just heed the word of God, please. Jesus said he came to set the captives free. But think about this. Are these the words of, that are illustrating God to a saved person? That, the, that God is angry? That he's putting the saved person in prison to be tortured? And he gets his debt back? Is that the saved person? Seems kind of weird to me. Doesn't sound like a saved person to me at all. You've got to do something with this. Listen, I'm, I'm just going to go into the seats with you guys right now and just tell you that I'm still processing all this stuff, too. Because I came from a Southern Baptist church. And this is like, they'd have me tarred and feathered right now. But I'm just saying, I, I, you know, like when I, when I first got saved, I was so happy and I'm reading the Bible and everything, I'm going to church and everything's great. And I'd sit in my seat and the preacher whom I love dearly owe him everything. He led me to Christ. But he'd be reading stuff and, I'm, and I've, I've got my Bible and he's reading, and I'm looking, I'm going, sitting like this, and I'm going, that's what that says. I mean, I love that man. And I know that you love me, but, but you, need to, you need to make this more, your love for this and your commitment to this must, must exceed your commitment and love to me. Th- that's all that matters is what it says. And I'm only asking you to... Just to, to this week, would you just consider this kind of stuff? Just consider what is written. Don't just sweep it under the rug. Okay, so, so here, here's another one. God's got this, right? God's got this. We're talking about the sovereignty of God. My joy, my pleasure, my happiness. I need this. God's got this. How many, let me ask you a question. How many people in this room need to see God move in a big way right now in something big? Raise your hand. Something big. Okay, look at this. Every single person except my wife. She already got her miracle right here, right? Come on. <laughs> right? She's so lucky, right? <laughs> I mean, so seriously, like, we need, we need healing. We need we got addiction stuff, relational stuff, financial stuff. So like I said earlier, greater understanding leads to greater worship. So look at 5.8. God blesses, or blessed are those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Okay. Greater understanding leads to greater worship. Hebrew, okay, let's just talk about the see God thing for a moment. 
Hebrews 12.29 says that God is a consuming fire. Okay? John, uh, John 6.46, this is Jesus speaking now in the sermon that we're studying. In red, he says, Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I, he's pointing to himself, right? Only I, who, has, who was sent from God, have seen him. Okay? No one has ever seen... Jesus said, no one's ever seen this unseen God except me. And then God himself, the unseen Father, the one who spoke at Jesus' baptism, and they all like heard the voice, right? Like, <gasps> He says in Exodus 33, 20, just for clarity, he says, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. Okay, you will never see God. Do you understand? You will never see God. No one can, he said, and don't think that because you're in heaven, you get to see the sovereign king, the father. You will never see God. To see him is to die instantly. Do you understand? So, so when the Bible says those people, the ones with the pure heart, will see God, you have to let scripture interpret scripture. And scripture and every scripture is God-breathed, right? So the words of, like, quoted in Exodus of God and the words of Paul, are they of equal power and value and truth? Absolutely. Because they're, they're all his words. But listen, God quote here, right? It's beyond red. It's, I don't even know what color it would be if it was God the Father speaking. But it says, if you see me, you die. You see me, you will not live, okay? So when it says... You will see God. You don't see God. You see what he does. You understand? So, so, like, no one has seen God, but like Romans 1, it kind of talks about this. Like, it says that since the beginning, everyone, everyone, raise your hand if you're part of everyone. Right. Absolutely. So he's preaching to you, right? Everyone knows that there's a God because of the things that he's done. So if you want to, so, so that's not what he's talking about. It's not like you're going to just see what he does, because everyone does. So, what does he mean, Lord? What do you mean? Well, if everyone sees what God's doing, then why would Jesus say, you'll see God, but yet you don't get to see him? So he must be talking about something special that not everybody sees. Would you agree? If you need to see him do something powerful in your life right now, personal, in the current kingdom of, that you're living in, that's what he's talking about. If you want to see him, if you want to see him move in your situation, you need to have a pure heart. Like, everyone's going to see trees. Everyone can know that Brains receive electricity so they keep going. Everybody can jump and see gravity. Everybody can see the ocean. So we can see what he's done. But if you want to see him move powerfully in your life, not everybody gets that. Only those that are, have a loyal, a pure, an uncut, an exclusive ownership Heart, exclusive dependence, they put a ring on his finger. Those people will see him move in their life. It's not for everybody. That's why not everybody's getting that. You understand? James would say that it's, he talks about a, a double-minded man. is unstable in all of his ways. Look, do me a favor, go to, go to the book of James. I want you to see it too. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse, verse 5. It says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God. He'll give it to you. He won't rebuke you. He won't, he'll, with no reproach. He won't, he won't get on. Oh, I can't believe you're asking me for stuff. Don't bother me. I'm a busy God. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. There's that pure heart right there, right? I depend on you. I absolutely trust you. I need you. You're my sole provider. You're everything to me. I would only come to you for these things. No one else. Do not waver. 
For a person with divided loyalty is as unstable as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such, listen, here it is. Such people, the ones with the undivided, with the, with the divided heart, with the unloyal heart, with the, such people should, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. From the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they're unstable in everything they do. Do you see it there? Right? If you, if you, if you like, hey, you know what, I, I, I rely on you, God, for my salvation, but I don't rely on you for my provision. That's divided loyalty. I, I, I rely on you to keep my marriage together, but I don't rely on you for my business. That's divided loyalty. In my business, I'm a shrewd businessman. I'm smart. I'm creative. I'm funny. I can, I can run a meeting, man. I can get people to sell for me, man. No, you can't do anything. That's a divided loyalty. That's, a, that's not a pure heart. That's a divided heart, right? So maybe you don't see God show up in power because of divided trust, divided loyalty, and if you do, don't expect anything. <laughs> don't expect anything. Here's one last one. I want to just, I want to just get through three verses, y'all. Can we get through three verses? Here's one last one. But before we read the last one there in, in Matthew 5, do me a favor and go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 12. Very familiar very familiar verse. If you've done any Bible reading, any studying, any time in church, you're going to know this verse. You're going to go, oh yeah, I know that one. Some came. Um, some people rejected Jesus. That's a bad day for them. He says, but all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Jonathan, can you read yours loud and clear? This is King James. Go ahead. Oh, okay, Herb. Okay, the power to become the sons of God. Now just, again, I'm not telling you what to believe here. I just want you to heed the word of God in a careful way. Maybe you haven't before. This is important. He gave them the power to become a child of God. Has anyone ever heard that all of us are children of God? Okay, that is so not true. I'm a Bible guy. I believe the Bible is true, not what anyone else thinks. We're not all children of God. We're all creations of God, made in his image to be like him, but not everyone is a child of God. See, we, we equate child with something we produce. So we want to we create our God in our image. Right? That's false. Just because he produced us, that doesn't mean we're, we're his kids. We're his creation. Okay? Not everyone's a child of God. Only Christians are children of God, sons and daughters of God. Do you guys get that? Right? That's what it said. Some refused, they're not. Some who said yes to him, that you know, they got saved, if you will. It says he gave them the power to become children of God. My Bible says gave them the right to become children of God. Now, Keeping that in mind, quickly go back over to Matthew chapter 5, and let's read our last verse for the day. Blessed are those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. <clears throat> okay. This is a tough one. And it's not because God's not sure. It's because I'm not bright enough to, to maybe say this. So I need his help. If you're a believer, you're taught that you're a son or a daughter of God. Right? I would beg to differ. Only on what it says. When you say yes to Jesus, he's given you the right to become. That's an offer. He's not confused in his words. 
If he wanted it to say, if you say yes to me, you are a child of God, he would have said it. But he didn't. What did he say? He said, you have the right to become. But in the other verse that we just read, he says, no, no, those people, they are. So let me just help you with that. Colossians 1.20 says that, that God made peace with everything through Christ on the cross. Right? That's how he did it. That's the gospel. Do you guys understand? That's the gospel. Jesus on your cross, paying for your sin, becoming sin so you could become holy. That's how he, ma- that's how he created peace between God and people. And Jesus is telling us here in Matthew 5, 9, if that's who you are, are you the person that's going around and trying to do that? Blessed are the peacemakers. How do you make peace? Do you make peace in, in God's context? Do you make peace by stopping war? Or do you make peace by the ministry of reconciliation? All right, come on. The ministry of reconciliation is how peace is created in the Bible. This is not about wars. This is not about uh, Paula and Marie squabbling. That's, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about kingdom of heaven stuff. How you get to be part of that thing. Th- th- we're agents of reconciliation. God has given you the task to make the plea on his behalf to the people who are lost. If that's who you are, those people are my children. Don't stop at the cross, man. Don't stop at the cross. Colossians 2.6 says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus, you must continue to follow him. What does that mean? Don't let someone deconstruct that or, or, or reduce it down to saying that if you don't, then you're backsliding and you're going to have a bad day. He's talking about how you got saved, y'all. He's talking about how you initiated the relationship between you and God again through saying yes to Jesus. You were reconciled. You said yes to him. And he says, and you must continue to do so. As you got saved, so you must walk. Look at Hebrews 3.14, please. And listen, you, I already know there's people in the room that aren't agreeing with what I'm saying, and I don't, I'm not, we're a non-denominational church. I'm not telling you, when someone comes to this church and says, what do you all believe? I say, I don't know, I'll tell you what I believe. But I can't tell you what Kim believes, and I can't tell you what Greg believes, and I can't tell you what Susan or Marshall, because we all, we, all, we all have our own thing, right? you got a Bible, you got a mind, you got the Spirit, you decide. i tell you what I think. And I'm just telling you right now, because I love you, and, and if I had my way, none of the revolution people would be the person that says, Lord, Lord. And he says, I never knew you. I don't want that to be you. So I'm just bringing this, these verses. I want them to come to bear weight on your life. Like, not because of what I think. or Like, just let the verse speak to you. Hebrews 3.14 You must, I'm going to start 13. You must warn each other every day while it is still today. That's what I'm doing right now, guys. That's what I'm doing. So that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. That's what I'm doing. I'm making a plea to you to heed the word of God. Do what you want with it, but I have to let you know. And this is what he's, this is the follow-up statement to that. This is, this is the, this is the warning. For if we, if, say if. If we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Let me ask you a question. To the best of your ability, to the best of your knowledge, those that are going to rule and reign with Jesus on the new heaven and the new earth, does God withhold anything from you there? Does anyone disagree with that? Is he withholding things from you when you're in heaven? Or are you ruling with him and sharing in all of God's glory with him? Is that what the Bible teaches? Okay, so go back. What does it say? 
For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. If. Don't stop at the cross. Don't stop at the cross. Colossians 1.22. We're almost done, guys. Thank you for bearing with me. But it's like super important, right? Colossians 1.22. Look at it. Please, I beg you, look at it. I'm going to go a verse before that. I say this all the time. You were once far away from God. Did you know that? You were his enemies because of your sinful thoughts and actions. Because your sin... Because you're of your willful sin, you're an enemy. Because of your passive recipient, re- receiving the sin nature from Adam and Eve, you're a sinner. So, like, you got a, you got a bad thing going there, right? It says, but God reconciled you back to himself through the death of his son, Jesus, on the cross. And because of that, he, God, has brought you into his presence holy, blameless, and without a single fault. Can someone say amen? Amen. That's great news, right? Is that great news? Is anybody happy about that? You didn't deserve it. You got it. Like, that was amazing. Was that you on the cross or was that Jesus on the cross? Did you earn that? I did not. But, just look look at the text. But, That's a qualifier for the previous statement. (laughs) But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. I was not taught that. I was taught you say yes one time, you're good. And you receive the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness, all you need at the cross. And then I read the word of God. I mean, I... Don't stop at the cross. If you want mercy, you give mercy. You want forgiveness, you give forgiveness. You want to see God move in your life? You want him to show himself strong in your situations, in your circumstances? Well, you can't stop at the cross. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says that he shows himself strong to the one whose heart is completely his. That's another way of saying those whose hearts are pure, they will see God. A loyal heart invokes God's participation in your life. God's got this. But don't assume that just yes to Jesus on the cross is all that you need. Guys, I just want to close by saying as the sovereign king of the universe as the sole governing authority of himself and all that he has created, he has decided to give you choices that will determine whether you get his rewards. Do you want mercy? Do you want forgiveness? Do you want to be a child of God? Do you want God to move in your life and help you? See, you know because of God's word here in Matthew 5 that those people who get that stuff, they're the happy people, right? They're the happy people. And that's what we've been studying, how to be happy. And I want you guys to all be folks just like that. And so I want you to forget me I want you to forget the messenger I want you to forget everything that we've done here today but I don't want you to forget this do not go beyond what is written 
and let your relationship with Jesus Christ, let your relationship with the Holy Spirit, and let your relationship with God the Father be defined by what is written. Not some denominational tradition, not some pastor in the past, not what your mom and dad taught you. Do not go beyond what is written. Amen? I want you guys, I don't want a single person, if I had my way, I wouldn't want a single person that over the years will call this their home to be one of those people that Jesus looks at and says, I never knew you. That would crush me. Do, throw me a bone and don't be that guy. Okay, and if you let the word of God define your relationship with God in its fullness, you won't be that person. You'll be the person that he'll say, oh, you're with Jesus? Come on in. That's what I want for you guys, okay? So don't set your heart on me. Don't set your heart on revolution. Don't set your heart on any other pastor. Don't set your heart on any denomination or any movement or any brotherhood or anything like that. Set your heart on God as defined in God's word. Would you come to your feet? Would you come to your feet, please?